Hello and welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe video and advice and insights podcast. We're recording both at the same time, uh, pretty much in the interest of time. The message is going to overlap a lot and um, there's just so much going on. I needed to double up here this week. I actually don't normally like doing that. I prefer to have a different uh, content that we're doing at the video each week letting the video be kind of, you know, ad hoc to what's happened that particular week in the market and in the world around us. And advice and insights, I'm usually picking a particular topic I want to dive into. Um, but if I were picking a topic this week in advice and insights, it would be the month of October. It would be kind of recapping this, uh, this month that we just had because of it being such a significant month in the market overall. And since that's obviously what people who watch the video want me talking about, um, I figure it's a pretty good week to be doubling up our message. So whether you're viewing right now or listening, um, I hope you get a lot out of this. If you're listening and not viewing, um, then I uh, can only tell you that you don't know what you're missing. And for those of you that are viewing, you know how unfortunate of a media choice you made. So here we go. Uh, listen, um, as I'm recording, it's the middle of the day on Thursday, November the 1st. So the month of October has ended, but the week that we're in has not. And the market, it was up uh, 650 points, let's call it, on Tuesday and Wednesday. And now we're up over 200 here right now. Uh, but again, there's a couple hours to go, so don't hold me to it. Um, we were up about three or 400, I think, at one point on Monday, and then we dropped 300 or 400. So you had like a 700 point net net, uh, intraday move in the Dow, um, on Monday, but on the week, as it is right now, we're up, oh, 400, 500 points, uh, more or less on the week. Um, and this comes off of what was by far the worst month of the year in the market. Um, and actually in the S and P 500 in the Dow, it was the worst month in the stock market since September of 2011. And in the NASDAQ, it was the worst month since October 2008. Let me give you a little color behind that. The, the Dow was down, um, let's call it 6% on the month. The S&P was down 6.9% on the month. But the market opened the first couple days of October up. So if you if you look at from the October 3rd close, which was the all time high with both the Dow and the S&P um, and the Nasdaq, by the way, uh, the for, at that level, the S&P is down 7.3 percent from its all time high as of yesterday's close. And that was with a, uh, a good 650 point uh, move in the Dow to finish out the month. So we did get to down to about 10 percent. From our peak to our trough, that's what we call a correction. Uh, that would be our second correction this year because we did the same thing in February. And then, of course, we know from February we bounced all the way back and, in fact, made new highs. Now we've had this other correction, and we'll, we'll see where things go from here. The carnage was worse in the NASDAQ. I'm kind of being nice to say the NASDAQ is down 9% because there's certain names within it that were down 25 30% on the month. And those are some of the biggest names that are held, including the infamous Fang stock. Some of those names were pummeled that way. Um, so a lot of carnage uh, in, in stock market price performance in the month of October. Uh, the global diversification didn't do anything to diversify. Uh, Japan um, holdings were down about 9%. Anything exposed to kind of global trade. Uh, emerging markets were again down uh, quite significantly. China um, continued its downward move um, on the Shanghai market. So Europe down significantly. So there was not a place for an equity investor to hide other than certain safety or defensive or dividend oriented sectors in the United States. Um, you had an awful lot of names in consumer staples, telecom, utilities, even some of the financials that were uh, some of the healthcare, meaning big pharma, uh, pharmaceutical companies up on the, the month. Um, 
so in our particular case, those were the names that really uh, created a big outperformance in October in our U.S. dividend stocks relative to the rest of the market. Um, there were an awful lot of things still down big, but when you get your kind of Walmarts and Procter Gambles and Verizons and Mercs, um, all up between five and eight percent on the month, McDonald's, uh, those types of names having those returns helped offset a lot of the things that were also down significantly. Um, in terms of a balanced portfolio, you know, asset allocation is the funniest thing in the world because people uh, obviously don't really like it. And what I mean by that is they need it and they desperately want it. But what asset allocation does is take things that can be brutal and makes them less brutal. And, and that's still not, you know, all that positive. But then when things are all going really well, there's something doing less well than others. So there's always something to resent in asset allocation. You either in a good market resent the things that are not doing well or in a bad market, you resent the fact that any that you're down overall. Uh, you, you have an, human nature has incredible ability to become very focused on absolute returns when things are negative and to be focused on relative returns when things are positive. It's kind of just what it is. I'm not really saying it negatively about anybody. It's a description of the human psychology that goes into investing. Um, well, we've talked a lot over the last several weeks. I think that we've created as much content and material, whether it be audio, video, written, for you to kind of digest uh, as all these things were going on, I think is one of the heaviest content creation months I can remember. And the reason for that is because there's a lot to say. And I think that when things are go are really volatile and vulnerable in markets is when people are looking for those things more than ever. So I want to kind of summarize what where I think we are. And, and, and I don't really take back anything I've said throughout the month about the source origin of this volatility. I believe that uh, first and foremost, it's extraordinarily normal to have periods of market gyrations. And even if this level of gyration is somewhat abnormal, having abnormal gyrations is very normal uh, as, as market cycles go. Um, we have had 20 plus 5 to 10% drops throughout this bear, uh, excuse me, bull market. So you got a market up 300% and you've had over 20 periods where we dropped in between 5 and 10%. And so uh, th those things will happen and are part of being an equity investor. And any attempt to uh, uh, kind of, you know, ignore that, pretend it isn't so, uh, soften it, sanitize it is, is either dishonest or, or um, uh, naive, okay? Now, once you accept that it's kind of reality and part of the deal, then it's more engaging and, and, and safe to analyze things. And I, I believe, as I've recapped for you before, the tension point we face is that we have a very strong U.S. economy. The U.S. Federal Reserve is working towards normalizing a monetary policy that was left in a kind of post-crisis mode. And now we're not in a crisis or even in a crisis hangover. We're well past crisis. You got GDP growth that's going to end up averaging, you know, well over 3% on the year. You have unemployment below 4%. Uh, wages growing 2.9%. You have all these things happening in the economy that don't even belong in the same, you know, I would say in the same paragraph, but they don't even belong in the same book as this accommodative monetary policy framework, but it's left over from the post-crisis era. And so they have to kind of work to normalize. So they're working to normalize as meaning raising interest rates and reducing their balance sheet liabilities. And so they're essentially doing that while the economy is very strong and yet the rest of the world is not. And you, and you, you throw in a trade war to that mix and there's a lot of vulnerability. So you have China's growth slowing down. You have the European Union, which has not really created much organic growth at all since the financial crisis. And with a bazooka of stimulus, both monetary and fiscal stimulus thrown at the European Union, it was not able to really get much momentum. And now they're starting to talk about preparing for pulling back some of that monetary stimulus. 
So Europe has not been a great growth partner or any kind of growth partner at all. Italian bond spreads have indicated a lot of vulnerability there. The entire continent is a political hot potato. The UK is dealing with kind of the logistical aspects around Brexit. Um, and, and so that is in this overall conversation of global vulnerability from China to Europe, uh, very little support there. Uh, Japan has not been a big economic grower, uh, even though their corporate economy is in a period of real rebound. Uh, they still have, obviously, the, the continued impact of um, absorbing all of the things they've done in a counter-deflationary way over many years. And then you have emerging markets that have a lot of debt denominated in U.S. dollars and a dollar that's been rallying based on all of this monetary divergence. And so the currency impact in emerging markets, which is really a way of saying the debt impact, uh, combined with a lot of these countries being heavy trade partners and very fearful around what exactly the trade uh, paradigm looks like. It, it, it helps to explain why emerging markets have gotten hit quite severely. I, I would argue probably too severely. So um, sounds pretty negative, right? You got Fed mon normalizing monetary policy and you have this global conditions. And yet uh, we're in the middle of earnings season. We're about two thirds, three fourths now of the way through. And it uh, looks like we're going to be at about uh, 22 and a half, 23 percent year over year uh, earnings growth um, in quarter three, which is just unbelievable. Fifty nine percent of S&P companies that have reported so far have uh, surprised or outperformed expectations in revenue and 77 percent have done so with earnings. Um, but you have one of the most underwhelming responses to good news meaning stock performance after a company beats expectations has been as poor as it's been in many, many years. And so the reasoning behind that is exactly what I'm referring to, that there's a repricing of assets around this reality and that there is vulnerability, fear of a contagion risk in the global economy, one that I think makes perfect sense. Um, you also, by the way, did start this whole period with an, a, very, a very expensive segment of the market being a leadership sector. And that was obviously this high tech, new tech, cool tech uh, technology space, a lot of the FANG stocks, things like that. So they had to have a lot of air come out of them. And you can't have air come out of your largest market capitalization companies without it bringing down the whole market, uh, index funds, selling, and things of that nature. So you, you look at three or four things. They're separate from one another, but they're connected to some degree. You stir it all up, and there shouldn't be a lot of confusion as to why it ended up being a challenging month in the markets. Now, what does an investor do from here? Does an investor assume markets are going to rebound big in November? They do not assume that. Does an investor assume that we're dropping another 2,000 points? Investors not assume that either. Anyone tells you they know what the next 1,000 point or 2,000 point move will be is wrong. They do not know. They could guess correctly, but they don't know. And, and, and that speaks to the inerrant unpredictability of markets. So um, I need to wrap it up here. I've gone on for a little while, but I do think that the posture one ought to take right now, this is not a cop-out. This is the smartest advice that I can give. And that is to embrace, not reject, the very permanent understanding of diversification as something that should always be making you upset if you're lucky, if you're doing it right. There's always something losing, and that's what you want because you don't want to expose yourself to the gravity, the violence of a downturn when everything can explode at once. And within a properly diversified portfolio, you will have downside, but it will be within a bandwidth of acceptability. And I'm very certain that's the case for my clients that had portfolio values decrease this month, but we did so within the construct that we deliberately, intentionally, and I believe intelligently uh, created on behalf of our clients on an individual by individual basis. 
So diversification is very necessary in an environment like this. Tactically speaking, where has value been created? I would continue to believe non-correlated investments make a lot of sense right now as stock and bonds uh, reprice around Federal Reserve uh, changes. So the alternative space not only has performed very well year to date for uh, a lot of people, but also represents, I think, a very important place to overweight assets going forward. Um, I, I would not be trying to time things with the market. Opportunistically, I happen to think emerging markets, which very well could go lower, but represent a deeper value. The expected rate of return I have looking two years out is higher in emerging markets than it would have been, say, you know, a month ago, three months ago, six months ago. Um, we love our positions in more defensive U.S. equity. That uh, dividend growth sector of strong quality companies is very important. If you do not have an adequate amount of quality in your equity portfolio, that needs to be revisited. But um, ultimately, maintaining percentages, looking to rebalance, uh, looking to stay within risk-reward relationships that are appropriate for your situation is the right thing to do. Someone wants me, I, I had a couple inquiries this week that want me to go on TV and say, what is technology going to do next week? And does what's the job the job report mean now or the auto sector report mean for the economy or the stock market in the next month? And I don't have answers to that. I have to politely decline those interviews. But I know the truth that whoever they get to go on TV and answer those questions in my absence doesn't know either. It's an unknowable set of data that people are playing around with. It's a vulnerable time in the market. It's not a time to take on too much risk. It's not a time to go hide and then create and leave yourself susceptible to the emotion of regret. Exiting investments that then you're going to have a very hard time re-entering at higher prices later. This is the stuff we do. This is our job to keep people properly allocated. I will gladly take people being upset over the fact that asset allocation creates winners and losers at all time. Then I will take blowing somebody up. This is no time to blow yourself up. Be cautious, be prudent, be disciplined. And that is the end of our Advice and Insights podcast, our Dividend Cafe video. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Whatever forum in which you're participating, please subscribe. Uh, please tell your friends. Please write nice reviews. Give us stars. Whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, it helps build up that traffic and then gives us some metrics by which we can gauge things. We want to make sure we're kind of understanding what people are doing and what they want. So we need that data to do it. Blah, blah, blah. I got to go back to work. Thank you for listening and watching and have a wonderful weekend.